very much. I'm very pleased to be here and to see uh, uh, a good number of folks that uh, I know. Um, so I've been asked to speak about the Canadian experience, and what I'm going to say will really, uh, I think, nicely build upon what Dr. Maya has told about the experience in the UK, and what Dr. Ertz has uh, shared with us about uh, uh, enzyme replacement therapy in, in the Netherlands. And, and as you'll see, I don't think there's that many differences. So I am required by my university to indicate what relationships I have with industry, uh, which might be some uh, potential source of bias. So I have received funding and consultant fees from uh, Amicus, Genzyme, and Shire, who all happen to be sponsors of this uh, event today. So I'm going to briefly talk about enzyme replacement therapy in Canada, what our guidelines are, how, what, how our guideline process works in Canada, because that really has not been made public, because uh, up to now I don't think anyone's been terribly interested. Um, and I'll review our guidelines and, and where we are now with those and talk a little bit about the CFDI study. So you know, enzyme replacement therapy um, up to around 2005 was based upon the following evidence. We, we showed that when you gave a galsidase alpha, a retrogal, or a galsidase beta thabrazine, the same thing happened at the plasma levels of the lipids, GB3, GL3, whatever you want to call it, fell by 14 weeks and persisted in patients treated with, with either one of these drugs. And as well, there was additional evidence showing that, with again, with either drug, that you could take any uh, tissue that you wanted to look at, whether it was kidney, whether it was skin, whether it was heart, you could show that, again, the GL3 or the lipid was uh, reduced or removed from these tissues uh, as indicated here. So that was really the, the knowledge that we had in 2005 when these two drugs were licensed in Canada by uh, um, Health Canada. And they remain uh, licensed here. So in 2005, we had an expert committee uh, that got together to decide on some uh, guidelines. Uh, who were we going to treat? Who, who were we not going to treat? And at that time, we looked at the literature, what was published about Fabre disease. Um, and we basically sat in a room, reviewed all these papers, looked at all the evidence, and said, what is the evidence that treating patients is going to make a difference, who should we treat? And at that time we said, well, if the kidney function is decreased by 20%, that's the same 80% that Dr. Nada had in his uh, guidelines in the UK, that would be uh, indicative of you know, significant kidney involvement, we need to treat those patients. And in addition, when we looked at the heart, there was, we recognized that there was a number of heart changes, again indicating significant organ involvement that would be indications for, treat for treatment. And those would be increased thickness of the heart, uh, abnormal rhythms, whether there was heart failure per se. Again, not different uh, really from what you've heard from both the UK and, and the Netherlands. We felt that evidence of stroke and TIAs, mini strokes that we call trans ischemic attacks, were bad indicating uh, disease severity, and even though there is no evidence, even today, that enzyme replacement therapy reduces the incidence of stroke, this is a sign of severe disease, and these patients need to be treated. We recognize that certain patients had severe GI symptoms, disabling diarrhea, 20 bowel movements a day, you can't work because you're spending the whole day in the bathroom, uh, and, and where these symptoms were unresponsive to more conservative measures, a variety of drugs. Uh, Dr. Main has outlined some of these other adjunctive therapies that patients with Fabry's disease may need to have, where these patients didn't respond to other types of therapy, um, there was evidence that their GI symptoms would respond. And so we felt that this was also an uh, important indication for treatment. And lastly, pain. Uh, this is neuropathic pain very uncomfortable, unpleasant, doesn't respond to other types of treatment very well, but we know that it can be reduced uh, to a certain extent by use of enzyme replacement therapy. So we felt that this was also important. So those were the five indications that we felt were important to 
to treat for Fabry's disease in 2005. And these uh, guidelines, in fact, our entire treatment guidelines, which outline investigations for patients uh, as well as treatment, are indeed on the internet at the Garrett website for all to see. Um, and, uh, and our management guidelines, investigations and so forth, are in fact extremely similar to what Dr. Meda has already nicely outlined for you. In fact, I would say that there's a few investigations that are done in the UK that we don't do in Canada, uh, so we're, we're probably not quite as rigorous as, as, uh, as the UK group. Um, so we're, we're doing a few less than investigations in our patients, but we're still monitoring the important things in terms of uh, brain status, with MRIs and CTs, cardiac status, echoes, EKGs, um, things like that. Uh, Holter monitors, renal function with blood tests. Uh, in Nova Scotia here, we, we do do the nuclear medicine GFRs. Uh, we look at amount of proteinuria, what's blood pressure control, and things like that. So the very similar sort of themes emerge uh, through uh, these different documents. So this expert committee that we have uh, is chaired by myself, but in addition to that, there pediatrician, medical geneticist, uh, another nephrologist, a cardiologist, a neurologist, and a metabolic specialist. So specialists from across the country, from a, a, a number of diverse backgrounds, different training, but all with expertise and great interest in fabric disease. And we meet annually independent of government, industry, and the CFA. So there's no, should not be uh, accusations of bias one way or the other. And we review all the literature published in the last 12 months to look at uh, what's new, are there, do we need to change our guidelines, and so forth. And we've done this annually since 2005. So what, what do we do with our guidelines? Well, they are submitted to uh, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. They have a role in uh, supervising the Canadian February Disease Initiative Study, with which many of you know about this, maybe uh, one of the uh, volunteer subjects in this study. And there is this International Scientific Oversight Committee, which is made up of specialists from largely outside Canada, there's a few from within Canada, and their role is to supervise our study and to make sure that it has sufficient scientific rigor, that it's conducted accordingly to the accepted standards for a clinical trial. And they're always happy to point out to us any deficiencies that we have so that we can fix them. So we submit an annual report to them, and you'll find that our annual report is placed on the internet by CIHR. Our first year report is out there, and I think the second should be very shortly if it's not already. They've had it since April. So, um, and f from there, any uh, new guidelines that we have then have to go to all the financial sponsors of the CFDI, and unfortunately there's a whole host of those. The federal government, all provincial governments, nine or ten of those that have signed on, as well as the two manufacturers, that's Shire and Genzyme. Um, and so, and this is mandated in, by the agreements that were signed between the manufacturers and the provincial governments, and the agreement between the federal government and the provincial governments, that all are the basis for the Canadian Fibrase Disease Initiative study funding. And you'll note that the physicians are not party, we're not signatory to these agreements, we weren't asked about this. We simply have to abide by these regulations because these were the regulations that were, or stipulations that were put upon us when we agreed to do this study by government. 